Assalamu alaikum, good evening. Welcome to the first inaugural posting of our webinar of the 2020 revision series. Uh, we are just gonna wait for a few more participants to join us. Uh, so we'll begin in approximately two minutes, inshallah. Thanks so much and looking forward to join uh, in this event with each of you. Salam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Peace and blessings be with each and every one of you. Uh, my name is Gerald Hankerson. I serve as the outreach coordinator at the Council on American Islamic Relations, Chicago Office of Illinois Chapter, known locally as CARE Chicago. And I'm happy to welcome each and every one of you, both in Zoom as well as Facebook Live, to the inaugural webinar for the 2020 Revision Series. Uh, this is a series that will explore uh, the crossroads of both the pandemics of racism and COVID-19 and what it means for us to really push through with social justice and civil rights efforts. Uh, the first of many, we hope, God willing, uh, to explore all the various aspects of making sure that we can stay committed to advocacy and build solidarity uh, through these unprecedented times. Uh, we would definitely have an agenda uh, with three of some wonderful panelists of the community that's in the work in various fields. Uh, but most importantly, we want to also make sure that with each webinar, we're able to really discover ways that we could be involved, proactive efforts and things that could sustain us and build us to be stronger. Uh, with that, one of the things we just wanna talk about very briefly, uh, that is the wonderful works with our long standing partners in the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. It's also co-sponsoring this event. I want to bring in one of my colleagues, Waliz Sakari, who will explain uh, the importance of the ongoing census work. Waliz. Thank you, Brother Gerald. Uh, Assalamu alaikum uh, and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Waleed. Um, and I'm just here to do a quick reminder for a lot of people who may have not filled out the 2020 census already. Um, a lot of us have been home for a long time or uh, had our activity disrupted. So. Um, it's just a reminder that the easiest way to take the census, if you haven't done it, is uh, to visit my2020census.gov. So um, as you may or may not know, the census is the population count, which serves as the basis um, for any data-driven decision that affects our states, our counties, our cities, our communities. Um, it affects uh, how much funding we get for you know, schools or infrastructure or libraries or uh, which bus routes or how many trains go which way. Um, and it affects uh, how they draw our, our electoral districts. So um, for the next 10 years, any of these decisions is gonna be rooted in the data we get. And Illinois 
uh, has one of the most diverse and uh, populations in the country, but it also makes it hard to count. Um, so don't like wait for the Census Bureau to come and bother you and knock on your door to count your, get yourself counted. Uh, visit my2020census.gov um, and it takes about 10 minutes. It's important, it's easy, and your data is secure. Um, so yeah. thank you, Brother Gerald. No problem, thank you, Willie. Uh, for now, uh, just to have uh, a brief uh, understanding of what uh, this event is all about for this particular uh, event, we want to really set the tone. The plan is for this to be a monthly series. Um, and so why not for the very beginning to kick off with really establishing how the COVID-19 pandemic converged uh, with uh, anti-Blackness and racism overall. Uh, so we'll have uh, the introductions and some insights from our three panelists. Um, and then of course, we'll go into the panel discussion with several questions to really explore uh, the convergence of those two pandemics and where we at in terms of really going towards a new normal, which we're all still trying to figure out what that means. Uh, of course, we'll have a, a Q&A. We hope to also invite you, our participants, to uh, really engage in discussion with us. Uh, do note that as of now, uh, of course, your uh, audio should be muted. But once it comes to the Q&A, we invite you to pose questions in the chat section. And definitely, of course, if you join us through Facebook Live, also feel free to comment uh, there as well. Uh, again, my colleagues Walid, as well as Chris uh, Navarez Azdar, will be helping out in coordinating uh, the Q and A public forum. Uh, we'll have one more important announcement towards the end, so please stay tuned to that. In the event that if the discussion is lively, we may go over uh, time to seven thirty for those who are willing uh, to join us and stick around. Uh, but by all means, uh, we'd like to commence now by introducing our wonderful panelists. Uh, can we have the next slide? So starting with, um, sorry, go back. My apologies, yeah. There we go. So uh, starting with Dr. Sema Asfar, who is with ICNA Relief. Uh, she is a longtime resident of Chicago, moving here in 1998, and has a multiple uh, nonprofits that she worked with over her years, uh, which amplifies her experience right now uh, since the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, she is with the Midwest region uh, of the Edna Relief Organization, which has served over 17,000 individuals uh, with services including hunger prevention, emergency financial assistance, health screenings, and so much more. And nationally, Edna Relief has served over 50, 550,000 individuals since the pandemic broke. Uh, so thank you, uh, Sema, thank you so much for joining. We next have Brother Khalil Rashid, who's a longtime Chicago native as well. Uh, he's the graduate fellow at Northeastern Illinois University here in Chicago, uh, where he serves as assistant press professor in the Department of, Pol of Political Science, as well as a researcher. Uh, his areas of interest include international relations, global studies, urban politics, and development. And he's been doing a lot of community activism uh, here locally. So thank you, Brother Khalil Rashid. <clears throat> Last but not least, we have Brother Aron Jason siebert Liera who is an immigrant rights attorney with the ACLU of Illinois, a uh, longtime civil rights uh, attorney uh, with over 15 years of experience uh, through litigation, advocacy, legislation, and education as a lawyer, organizer, activist, teacher, and professor. He too also worked with a litany of well-known and very important uh, advocacy organizations here uh, in Chicago and as well. Uh, so with that, uh, let's start with Dr. Sema to share a little bit more about self. Again, some insights on uh, the topic. Are we really all in? How are we fighting against COVID-19 and dismantling anti-Blackness? Dr. Sema. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi everyone. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Gerald and uh, Civic Coalition, Care Chicago, and um, everyone to give me opportunity to talk here. Um, I, um, I'm always in awe of our youth and young people like you who are leading the conversation. Thank you. Uh, Ikna Relief here, we are working actually, in, we are on the ground and uh, meeting with the families, peoples, very densely populated areas uh, where um, the need is huge. 
Um, and uh, since this uh, COVID started, even before that, way before that, we are working sin since uh, 2005, Ikhna Relief is uh, on the grounds and the situation is not good. And uh, pandemic actually, those who are hungry, they become more hungry. Those who are become about to become homeless, they are homeless now. Those who had a very, you know, daily wages, they don't have any jobs. So the situation is not good and uh, we are trying our best. And I really appreciate you inviting me and I would love to discuss more further. Jazakallah khair. Appreciate that, Dr. Sema. Brother Khalil. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Well, like salam. Sorry about that, I had to unmute. Uh, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam. Wa ala Rasulil Kareem. Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa min mila. Jazakallah khair uh, for having me um, as well as a part of this beautiful panel. Um, thank you to Care and Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition and all those involved uh, with putting this together. Um, much needed uh, work um, in an uncertain time. Um, as far as my work goes, uh, as Gerald mentioned, um, I am a graduate fellow at. Uh, Northeastern Illinois University in the political science department um, studying uh, global affairs and and um, now actually because of this uh, whole epidemic uh, may pivot uh, some of my studies uh, related to political science um, specifically in the categories of uh, urban politics and urban development um, which was in the plan um, but as we see I come here um, to share my experiences and, and hopefully gain some insight. And, um, you know, thank you uh, for creating this panel to create a, a dialogue, a uh, much needed dialogue, again, in these uncertain times. Um, so um, just like Dr. Simon, the rest of the uh, panelists, I'm here to discuss, you know, um, you know, it's, it's a reciprocal process, um, growing and learning, you know, new things every day related to the current times that we're in. And also, uh, like the last you mentioned before, you know, we passed it on, um, you know, um, being here um, as a Muslim and offering, you know, some of what Islam has to offer to those, as we see out in the world who are struggling for answers, struggling for solutions um, in um, understanding uh, that systemic change is needed to provide um, that. So hopefully, inshallah, this will be a, uh, a good, you know, starting point um, to create that uh, that that wave that's needed. Jazakallah. Laikum, Jazakallah khair to you too, Akhi. Uh, last but not least, uh, Brother Aaron. Laikum. Uh, this always reminds me of thinking that after the, everything passes and we're all going to be used to now having these memes, everything coming out, just having to say, uh, you know, so and so, you're muted, you're muted. And the person says, Oh, I'm sorry, I was mute because. <laughs> It's become the new norm that we have to make sure, okay, I, we got to actually physically unmute ourselves to even speak. Um, thank you for the introduction and for the uh, ability to be on this panel. Um, yeah, I, I think the most important thing that can come out of panels like this and, and, and moving forward is that it, it actually leads towards change. That we, we aren't getting this, you know, a few months where people feel activated and feel like they should get out and then it just dies out. Because what we had seen before all this happened was we had gotten to this point where people were just kind of doing like the click activism. Let me post something, see how many likes I can get. And wait, you want me to go out on the street? You want me to actually go protest? Uh, I got other things to do. I don't want to get out there. And we're actually seeing this start to happen again, which we haven't seen in decades. People actually getting out of the, out in the streets and, and wanting to, you know, needing to realize that that's what leads to change. When we saw what started to happen and all the people getting out in the streets, and then we see, obviously it hasn't been enough change yet, but we start to see how much has actually changed in a short amount of time, just because that pressure of people in the streets saying, no, we won't take this anymore. is so much more important than anything else that anybody can do because it shows we've got a collective voice that we're using. So that, that really, for me, is the most important thing that can come out of this. And moving forward, any types of panels and discussions that we have amongst ourselves, families, friends, everybody, you know, it, it, we should be, we should be using this time to talk with people who we could consider enemies and realize where do we have commonality? Where do we have common ground? Jazakallah khair, appreciate you, brother Aaron. 
Uh, and so just before we start the official panel, just wanna share again, the premise of this entire webinar series and this particular uh, event tonight. So myself, along with brothers uh, Walid and, and Chris, again, both of those brothers work with the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition and CARE Chicago uh, has worked alongside along uh, many civic engagement efforts, including uh, the aforementioned CISIS 2020 efforts, which has now been extended to October in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously everyone has been rocked by this. This is something that uh, for us in our own individual ways, as well as professionally, um, it's been a challenge to see how we can really stay committed and really making sure that our civil rights work is still impacting every single community member. But it became even more of a different outcry once we started to see that uh, different lives were impacted much more gravely uh, to the point where it's even fatally. And especially when it started to really uh, reveal what has already been known about the injustices that exist in our community. When you're talking about uh, non-access to healthcare, uh, to something uh, which should be as important as uh, measuring one's own uh, level of pain and being able to have the understandings of food and shelter, those things are all ever necessary, but it only seems for so many and so few. There's been so many uh, perspectives and analyses shared over the weeks, but this particular week, something really hit me in preparation for this event. Earlier uh, this week, it was discussion of the European Union uh, creating its own possible travel ban against the United States because our country, unfortunately, is still seeing now new record numbers, uh, high levels of confirmed positive cases of COVID-19. And where one news analyst was saying that our bodies are now being seen as a threat. So this is not any possible, oh, because I have this particular salary or job or this stature in society, every American will be labeled as a threat when not, not, not being uh, allowed into Europe. But at the same time, this is not only the individuals that have been seen as a threat, uh, practically for the entire existence in this country, people of color, especially those who identify as Black, have been seen as threats to the very existence of this country, whether it's through the meritocracy of capitalism, to the very idea of love, respect, nurturance, and acceptance. And so with this series, what we want to explore is, while we're trying to envision whatever a new normal is going to be, we need to really be consistent in making sure that we're not making even more dire collection of the haves and have nots. And that's what's being played out right now. And so with this particular event tonight, again, really want to set the tone for what we hope to uh, each month, uh, really explore what is going on within our society, but how we could be ages of change uh, through auspices of tradition and civil rights and social justice work. And so with that, let's commence with this panel discussion with our very first question. So in your professional roles and personal lives, how and where do you see both COVID-19 and racism intersect? And do you see the people around you understanding how these two pandemics relate? Explain. And we can start off with um, Dr. Sema just to uh, kick it off. Ladies first, huh? You ladies first. I'm <laughs> not sure. Okay, Rahim. So, um, you know, people are suffering. They are getting very, very, very frustrated. They are understanding what is happening. Um, uh, the areas where, if, if we just talk about Chicago, we are working in many different areas. You can say more than 20 areas where we are working um, in the uh, <laughs> side of Chicago, from Aurora, uh, uh, Glendale Heights. We have two main offices. One is in Glendale Heights. The other one is in Rogers Park. And Rogers Park, West Rogers Park is the highly infected area. Uh, it was the highly infected in the Illinois, the highest COVID-19 cases were, were there. And our case workers, volunteers, we were there. We were providing, trying to provide food to you know, community members. What we used to do, we used to have 500 families, which we used to support before COVID uh, with the food, uh, monthly food boxes and weekly groceries. 
as soon as this COVID is, uh, hit, uh, this pandemic started and we were in lockdown, uh, we received 10 times more calls. Can you imagine like 5,000 calls we received, you know? And we had to provide food without, because, because of the lockdown, volunteers were not there. Because of the lo lockdown, access to food was really, really hard. And we were trying to uh, establish some sort of system with our community members to provide food to those who are, who was, those people who have been calling us constantly. And we didn't want them to come out from their houses. And uh, those who had enough before the, before the situation, they still had enough, you know? Those uh, they didn't had, uh, you know, enough food, they, they, they were completely out of uh, basic, very basic necessities. So there is frustration, uh, there is anger. We are, we are actually uh, going to different parts of the cities like um, you know, 48th Street, 47th Street, 95th Street, Stony Island, uh, Sheridan Avenue. Um, uh, there are many, many, Roosevelt Road, you know, uh, many avenues where we, uh, there are food deserts, there are pr fresh produce is not even available. So this is just the food. Then we, we had the situation with the health. There were many families who were out of, um, uh, they, they didn't have, uh, you know, access to the health insurance to begin with. And with COVID-19, they didn't know what to do. They were very scared that as soon as they are going to say that they, they are affected by it, they, they'll put into quarantine and then, uh, you know, they will not be able to work. So we started telehealth line with Pakistani Physicians uh, uh, Society, and uh, which was allowing everybody to call and just get the enough information through professionals, through doctors were on the line. We had social workers and people were calling from all sorts of uh, you know, community members. So we are trying our best. And then on, on, on top of that, the situation was so bad we had situations with mental health issues. People were stressed out, depressed, anxiety, anger, how you are going to uh, provide all those uh, services. And um, the people are understanding the situation is sad. They are, they are feeling horrible. They are feeling bad. They are feeling let down. And we really need to come up with the solution where we can fill this gap. If there are funds available, how they are going to reach to these uh, community members and these uh, families who are uh, suffering. This is my say. MashaAllah. Khalil? Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, <clears throat> so just uh, going off of what uh, Dr. Simon is experiencing, because um, I know we'll get into it uh, a little bit later with some of the later questions. Um, being on the ground is very imperative and um, doing the footwork, but unfortunately during these times, uh, a lot of that is, you know, marginalized. But in terms of the overall theme of tonight's discussion and actually the series moving forward, um, you know, the, the question revolves a couple of different dynamics that, you know, I think, you know, especially early on, we should clarify and putting um, the, you know, the COVID-19 and the outbreak of, of racism and the intersectionality of it is uh, actually very, very creative, but understanding it is important um, and understanding, you know, some of the conceptual things fundamentally, which, you know, um, probably won't have enough time to tonight. Um, I'm, you know, trying to stray away from teaching the class, but uh, understanding racism as a pandemic, we got to understand that a pandemic um, has a couple of different definitions and so does racism, which is very entrenched within American society and American fabric. Obviously nobody knows that more than, you know, a lot of us who are minorities in this country, but um, understanding as a, as a pandemic, as an adjective, a pandemic is uh, a disease um, over, you know, a, a particular land or a particular country you know, and over, you know, uh, the world. Understanding um, a pandemic as a noun we see it as an outbreak, it's defined as an outbreak. So we see with the COVID-19 and all the systemic racist problems that exist, you know, clashing, um, which, you know, 
if you put yourselves in the shoes of the minority, particularly African Americans, you will see that you know racism. This isn't a sudden outbreak. This is something that has defined uh, this country. Um, and you know, me being you know a political scientist studying global you know affairs, um, I like to you know make certain connections. But um, you know, uh, also the pandemic, COVID nineteen, and racism, understanding it as a disease. Now, we as Muslims, we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about many diseases and ills that exist within the individual, society, country, so forth and so forth. So putting, you know, these things in, you know, its correct conceptual framework is important in order for us to make systemic change, which I believe um, Aaron, you know, talked about in his introduction, Dr. Simon led it to, you know, in, in, in her previous comments, looking at it you know, um, systemically creating a systemic change. And then, you know, um, with the little things that we're doing, such as what we're doing tonight, you know, moving forward. And I'll leave it, you know, at that, um, you know, first and foremost. And there are other things that I know that we can touch on with some of the later questions, but I just want to keep it concise. Shukran. Brother Arnold. Yeah, most definitely you have a, a sickness. It's a sickness that, that this country on you know i think for too long people like to think 1968 you know this culmination of the 60s of all these movements and the civil rights struggles and then for far too long i think the mentality was well we went through that struggle already racism was eradicated we don't have racism anymore and then people try to this point to trump and say well look well he's the problem he's not the problem the problem has always been there these communities that we look at that get into the media now because, oh, how dare they do this and how can they be so angry? Well, that's because since the 60s when these uprisings were happening and people were speaking up, nothing has changed. These communities, you still have black and brown communities where someone wants to open up a business, there still are no banks that are going to say, hey, we're going to give you a loan. Where's that collateral that they have? They don't have that, that history of family income that they can go on and say, well, here's some collateral. I wanna get this business loan. What this has done for me is, I'll look at it from the perspective of essential workers. We talk about essential workers. We talk about people that now we have a president and other people in this country who are gonna label people who work in the fields as essential workers. Where just a few months ago before all this happened, they were still trying to deport and get rid of everybody here who was here without any documentation and get rid of a lot of the, and a lot of these people are the people who work in the fields, whether they come from Mexico, whether they come from Central America, whether they come from the Philippines. We have people from all over the world who are working in the, these fields who are somehow now essential workers because we need to eat. And yet we still have plenty of food. I talked with my, my son's friend's dad and you know, he was telling me about talking with his family back in Nigeria and how his friend had to give his kids uh, Benadryl or you know, some sort of medicine so they would fall asleep at night because she said, I don't have enough food for them to eat dinner. And he looked at me and said, like, you guys are so uh, spoiled in this country. We're still, you know, we're on lockdown, yet we still have Wi-Fi. We still have cable. We still have food services deliver us food. But then when we see like with, with ICNA Relief and other groups that do this, there's plenty of people that need food and don't have access to this food. So there's this racism still that occurs when we look at who, who gets labeled essential workers. Because then we have curfews that then get you know, put in, in, in different cities. And we have people that are working these essential worker positions. And how do they get to work? Mass transit. And if that is not available to them or if they have to still take it and there, there's this pandemic happening, they're exposing themselves now to getting, expo getting exposed to COVID-19 for what? 10, 12, 15, if they're lucky, dollars an hour. Is this going to stay? I don't know. We had the 1950s where someone who was making minimum wage or could work in a grocery store could, could actually afford to take care of a family. That's not even the case. You can probably, you know, I, I don't even know what the numbers would say, but I know you probably work two full-time jobs at minimum wage and you're still not going to be able to provide for family. So what this has done is it's it's exposed a lot of the inequities that were already there and have always been there and people try to pretend like they were gone and, and fortunately 
we have enough people who have got their foot on the pedal who are not letting up saying, no, we need to talk about this. We need to address this now. It's been too long. Mashallah, there's a lot of points that you guys covered and we'll definitely explore much more deeply. And I think that's a nice setup for question number two, uh, because each of you pose certain challenges uh, that has always been present, but even more magnified and even more grossly expanded, right? So what new challenges have you experienced in terms of working in your respective fields? And, and you represent a great deal of them. So, you know, here listed social work, politics and community activism, and public health, immigration advocacy. Um, and, and how has these two pandemics really impact that? Uh, let's start back with uh, Brother Aron since he was kind of on a roll there. Okay, ah, uh, jeez. Again, I don't know if a lot of these are new challenges. You know, th these are things that have existed that they may new be new challenges in the eyes of people who wanted to pretend like they weren't there. When we talked for a long time about the fact that, you know, and I, I don't want to take from what other people might say, but I can just say quickly, like if we look at something like hunger, people look at other countries where there's st people who are starving. We have numbers here in this country we've had for a long time of plenty of people who are starving. Food deserts, food deserts that before this happened have now been made so much worse because you know so a lot of these businesses were uh, are now closed, and that's again when we look at the racism where this intersection lies. And we talked about this yesterday on our planning call. You know, we, we look at a lot of Muslim-owned businesses in these communities. And the interesting thing that I I heard from a friend of mine when we were talking about what was happening after what was happening in some of the neighborhoods on the south and west side was that he was saying this was really interesting to me that the businesses that people knew were good and were, were 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 people knew were in the community to help people they were untouched people knew this person's not here taking advantage of people they're here it's a legitimate business but if you had businesses where someone has a corner store selling liquor and they don't care who they sell to 15 year old comes in they don't care they're not asking for ids they're selling drugs sometimes out the back who knows what's going on People know what's happening. People know that you're not here for your our best interests. You're here just to make money. These things have existed, um, but you know, to, to say as far as the challenges, that's one of the things I've seen with the immigration you know, work that I've been doing. We're trying to get people released from immigration detention who are at risk for COVID-19. Again, you see a lot of people are from the undocumented you know community who are undocumented who are here who have been working, but if they happen to work in healthcare or were a field worker or maybe a meat packing plant, they might have the luxury in the eyes of some of being labeled as a essential worker, but they have not stopped picking people up. They have not stopped. They only waited for countries to open it back up before they started to deport people again. They're still doing it. I was on a call with a detainee, uh, you know, client of mine just an hour ago. He's being uh, sent back tomorrow morning. So this stuff has continued. It's just some people have, are picking and choosing who is essential, who we don't need, but that's always happened. We had a, a you know, Bracero program that existed for 20 years where this country was able to say, hey, we need these field workers to come in so we can pay them less and then they work in the fields, but they can only stay for a certain amount of time. But I, I don't wanna, you know, again, like, like Brother Khalil said, I don't, I don't wanna turn, turn it into a lesson because I could probably go on for another half an hour. So I will you know, pass it on. So I don't know, but that, that's, that's still good to highlight that there, there's this continuum that we need to continuously uh, reinforce on how these all are interconnected and very problematic. Uh, Dr. Saima, uh, you were also talking about food deserts, so would you like to continue in that? Yes, actually, it really took a toll on all of us, on, on our team, uh, the staff, the volunteers, some of us worked 15 to 18 hours. You know, it was very, very difficult time. It was very, I'm talking about the COVID-19 pandemic. It's, uh, we had, I just mentioned before too, that we, the cases, number of cases were increased, domestic violence increased in the community members. And we have a transitional housing for women and children and all the local shelters were closed because of this pandemic. And we were receiving calls. We used to receive calls, one to two calls every week, you know, from our uh, sisters who've been victim of domestic abuse. 
And now since the COVID has started, I personally was receiving one to two calls daily. Can you imagine that? I was receiving these calls and there was no place who could uh, take the, these ladies in. So we had to have, you know, uh, put them in the hotels or some other places. It's, it, was, it was crazy. It was really difficult situation, but I don't wanna only talk about challenges. We were, I, I remember in the beginning of these, uh, this uh, COVID-19, I was like, I didn't know what to do because we were, our phone line was ringing continuously for the food and other needs. And uh, our community stood up, you know, they, they stepped up, uh, mashallah, local massages, uh, Islamic center of wheat, and I really would like to mention, they opened their doors for us to use the masjid you know nobody else could do that they they gave us the keys that you can pack food boxes as much as you can and then uh, ciogc with their um zakat chicago uh is uh, darus salam mashallah darus salam mufti azim called me and he said like i'm raising funds for the food and he just quietly he came at the office and he dropped the check so our, our own community, Islamic Center of Naperville, our Mecca Center. So Muslims stood up, we raised zakat, we really provided uh, you know, food to almost 14,000 individuals or more. It, it was really crazy work. And then we, because most of our work, if you're talking about challenges, most of ICNA Relief work is depending on volunteers. And without volunteers, we are unable to do that. 80 to 90% work is done by volunteers. So we had nobody coming. And then we start making telephone calls. We made task force and different things. And mashallah, youth, they joined us. They start pouring in. We had to make a you know, proper ship so we can keep them under 10 in uh, you know, one time. And uh, that, that was very, very difficult. Then uh, in Rogers Park, where the, the you know, these uh, cases were so high, we didn't want community members to come and walk to our food pantry to receive the food. We thought as if we ask them to come, it will just uh, make it worse. So we plan to do the home deliveries. We start doing doorstep deliveries. And you can imagine how hard it is, you know, uh, doing home deliveries to thousand plus families homes with very, very few volunteers. It, it was very tough. I really wanna write a book <laughs> on these challenges. <laughs> wanna do a proper program on that because I have a long list of that. And really, really it opened up so many uh, beautiful doors, many, many, mashallah, beautiful souls. They start volunteering, they start, you know, coming uh, to donate uh, funds, alhamdulillah. They were coming and asking how you are doing. So it, it's, it, it was a challenge, but at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless a lot of blessings uh, through those tough times. In Nawal, Usre Yusra, you know. So there is always uh, something positive. There were even some times when we used to say, oh, I need, you know, uh, 100 rice bags. And subhanAllah, some, uh, any, any donor they call and they, they say exactly same amount of rice bags. Okay, we will donate this much. So it was, alhamdulillah, it was subhanAllah, amazing work, but very, very challenging. I'm glad you pointed to how the challenges there can very well much be uh, solutions and people standing up with community. I think that's always something that's been touted, not only within the Muslim community, but of course throughout uh, this country and nation. And so uh, that is a nice little segue for you, Brother Khalil, because I know you traverse the entire region going back and forth, being involved in a lot of work. So uh, of course, speak to the professional, but again, I would love to hear on a personal level what that means. Uh, for you with this question. Yeah, um, so in terms of challenges, um, I'm actually in, um, you know, in, in transition professionally. Um, I wasn't involved in social work and social services for a while, so I can attest to what the other two panelists are experiencing. Um, but I'm transitioning uh, from that field more into academics and into research because I believe that education is still one of the most important tools that we can have individually and collectively in terms of, of um, understanding, you know, a lot of these societal problems, uh, political problems, and, um, you know, all of these barriers that are up. Um, so in terms of um, 
you know, uh, social services and social work. I'm still in touch with, you know, some of the agencies I used to work for, particularly, you know, Department of Children and Family Services, um, um, a few mental health agencies um, where I did residential counseling. And obviously those who receive those services are at the bottom of societal's totem pole. So they always get the short end of the stick, even related to within the past maybe 10 years or so, um, the budget deficit in the state of Illinois, um, which cut a lot of services out. Um, so a lot of places are struggling, a lot of, you know, public, you know, uh, health agencies are struggling, um, you know, essential, you know, uh, services, which, you know, I, I know we'll talk about um, later on. Um, just a lot of uh, services are, you know, have been struggling for the past decade or so. And so what this pandemic has done was obviously increase you know, um, those problems. So I'm transitioning now into uh, education and research, particularly my fellowship is, um, you know, sponsored by uh, the Illinois State Legislator um, to increase the number of minority professors within public education here in Illinois. And we also know that public education across the board, um, particularly, I'm, you know, in higher education, but education from elementary uh, to high school to higher ed has also suffered from, you know, budget deficits and so forth. And so, you know, relating back to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, obviously we know that, you know, it hit dead in the middle of, you know, spring semester and, 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 and early on into the school year uh, for 2020. Um, and obviously a lot of, uh, you know, uh, students and a lot of uh, professors and faculty have had to have pretty much um, their profession just, you know, cut off from beneath their feet. Um, which obviously causes a problem both professionally and, you know, as well as providing the service of education to, you know, uh, the students. You know, time is yet to tell what's going to happen, um, but, you know, I'm particularly worried about my own kids who, you know, are young but are in schools. And that's one of the worst things that could happen, you know, as a student is to have, you know, a cutoff. I even, you know, argue against things like summer break, you know, I, you know, think it's too long um, because the mind goes idle and, you know, there'll be, you know, academic setbacks, obviously, uh, for anyone who, you know, is, is, is studying, but um, particularly related to, you know, um, the challenges, you know, that are there, obviously, you know, we're still in the midst of some of these turbulent challenges and, and these times, um, but like Dr. Simon, you know, alluded to, there are also benefits um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us, you know, blessings through, you know, these hardships and challenges. Um, and, you know, in terms of the da'wah and Islamic work, you know, we really see Muslims, you know, stepping up individually and collectively. You know, a lot of creative waves are, are, are happening, you know, throughout this pandemic. And so um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, but definitely, you know, um, it is it is a challenge and, you know, um, maybe, you know, this is one of the things as a Muslim, you know, that could uh, bring us back to providing Islam as a solution. That for me is, and already sort of the discussions already had, uh, we keep hitting that term essential. And, and that has been really uh, one of the first revelations that happened with the COVID-19 pandemic um, in terms of really underscoring like when and, and where um, in our priorities that we deem people to be important, necessary, valued, but as uh, Aron pointed out, to what extent, right? So with question three, and this, you know, for our participants of viewing, uh, this is one that's a bit contentious. So if we can have question three up. All right, thanks brothers. So there's been much discussion about what is essential especially when we prioritizing our public health against having like a strong economy. And so that's uh, only one of many different dichotomies that's continuously being uh, measured out. So what have we got right and what we got wrong within our society by distinguishing like who's essential, whether we're talking about people, where we're talking about our needs, where we're talking about different jobs and roles we play in and, and ideals and aspirations that we define within the country. And there's a few examples here, of course, uh, it's already been alluded to the idea of essential workers within uh, working in farms or of course in the meatpacking uh, plants across the country, or even once we start to look at 
the sports arena, right? There was some uh, particular controversies about, oh no, we're not gonna have the NBA or, oh no, you know, we may not necessarily be, you know, having a baseball season, which now supposedly is. But also think about too, how in some ways, these two pandemics are and have been uh, politicized. So quick example is seeing the vitality, right, of citizens and, and, and residents exercise the First Amendment rights when it's about the quarantine, no one's attacked, right? You see people with, you know, magazine guns and all these others standing in front of state houses, but you also see tear gas and, and beating by police when we're talking about anti-racism protests. So uh, Khalil, uh, you were starting to kind of go in that direction. So go ahead and lead us off with this one. Well, yeah, I mean, so for me, you know, this term essential workers, you know, I believe we're all essential, you know, um, if you want to leave it at the baseline. But, uh, you know, I, I think related to this pandemic, I try to look at it through the lens of a political scientist where, you know, I'm studying policy and, I'm, you know, you know, given even getting into a little, you know, law uh, related to how, you know, um, <clears throat> particularly this country is going about handling the pandemic. And like you said, it has been politicized. And so, you know, we've mentioned already that, you know, living in a capitalist, you know, uh, society, um, unfortunately, uh, when these challenges come, you know, they're going to be, you know, different, different interests that's trying to capitalize, for lack of a better word, off of, you know, what's happening. And so, you know, in terms of uh, what has been, you know, what, what has gotten right in terms of essential workers is still kind of hard to you know, uh, recognize, you know, for me, from a policy perspective, um, you know, and unfortunately, uh, the public health, uh, you know, sector um, is bearing the brunt of it. And uh, we know from our experience dealing with, you know, policies related to insurance, and um, who gets medical care. And again, going back to the roots of uh, systemic racism, uh, we know that, you know, marginalized groups, and, 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 and minority communities um, are always going to bear the brunt of uh, a pandemic such as this. Um, and so what has happened, you know, you know, in my belief, um, is that, you know, all of these things has contributed to, you know, uh, what we see in terms of um, the, the pressure from certain sectors of society and, and how, you know, um, race is, is, is an issue, um, how the media is dealing with, you know, uh, race, you know, and the pandemic. Um, the media is, in my opinion, a big part of, you know, um, agitating, you know, uh, these different factions of society. And so that's how I try to view it. Um, again, you know, um, you know, viewing it as a systemic problem and, you know, we can go into history, um, but, you know, this is this is nothing new within the context of American history. Right, and then that's something that we, for whatever reasons, uh, like was said earlier, only some people are starting to recognize it uh, for the first time ever, whether they voluntarily chose to ignore or um, it's, it's something that is now like they were forced to pay attention, right? Because we don't have the distractions and all you get to do is like really see where you at. So Brother Aron, uh, you kept alluding to this particular question. So floor is now yours for this one. Yeah, a nice way of saying I talked about it too early too. <laughs> no, you're good. Everything is interrelated. So I'm, I'm all here for it, brother. You're, you're fine. <laughs> I mean, that, this really, again, uh, addresses the necessity of having nationalized health care. We, we, we have a system where we don't want to pay people a lot when they're in these positions of someone handling our food and we want to pay them minimum wage and not care if they have health insurance. So, but even if you get into, into professional jobs, you still, we still have this mentality in this country, unfortunately, that's been driven into people that you still go to work sick. You still got to show up show them that you're going to work through anything which is the stupidest thing we can do because it's been proven that when a sick person shows up to work they get everybody else sick it's the same thing we've seen with covid with states that opened up too early or never closed like florida or texas or arizona 
you are just making you're open up to everyone else and, and and what we see from that is it's such a selfish way to look at it as well because it's and it's not through everyone's you know their own fault all the time because they're having to worry about their job are they still going to have a job but we look at societies that have been upheld in this country as far as being hard workers such as like japan and the hard worker yet you look at japanese federal law and they have up to i believe it's like 20 paid days mandated by federal law for every worker you know how many we have in this country by federal law zero you don't have to give a worker any kind of paid debt time off whatsoever in jobs you get two weeks off it's like they're giving you the world oh we gave you two weeks off you should be happy and you know one of the interesting things that this has done too is i've seen this in not just what we look as essential workers with hourly workers I've had this discussion with a lot of friends. It's also created situations where a lot of us who are working remotely, it's almost like, well, you're working from home. Where else are you going to go? Here's an email at 1030. We need you to hop on this. That's 1030 PM. Here's something at midnight. We need you to work on it, hop on it. It's, it's, it's started to blur these lines now, as far as when you even have your work hours, is it really just whenever you wake up to whenever you go to bed? So this, this opens up so many issues when it comes to workers rights and things that we really have fought in the past but what we've seen with this administration and just capitalism in general it, the eroding of workers rights you know that's been ongoing I, I was reading something interesting today when they're talking about you know they, they try to label chinese companies that as if they're the ones that were taking the workers from this country and opening the factories to take all the blame off of the people who actually own the companies who are moving the workers and the factories over in the first place so they can save some more money. So it, it's really how we frame these narratives. And unfortunately, what we've seen from, from a lot of it is it's, 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 we frame it and the person who's in power, who has the money are the ones who are framing these narratives. And it's also where we are placing uh, our priorities. We should want everybody in this country to be healthy and to have access to health care that shouldn't even be a question that's essential and if someone's handling our food we should want them to be healthy and have access to health care and not show up and sneeze on your food or be sick and get and, and show up because they have to because they have to worry about paying the rent and we're you know that that's just another issue we're going to start to see now too when we have all these things that have uh these freezes we've seen in different cities as far as evictions just wait for the next couple of months we're going to start to see some more ugliness once people start to get getting evicted if they don't renew the uh, you know the what they've been doing federally as far as at the extra six hundred dollars for unemployment if there's no more stimulus we're going to start to see a whole new you know world you know as far as what's going to happen and a lot of people are hurting because of what's what you know still plenty of people being out of jobs so what's essential is this you know it, it, there's so many different levels of it. It's not just saying, you know, someone who's working in the field, someone who's working in a meat packing. There's so many different levels. Like, like uh, Khalil said, you know, we all are essential workers in, in some sense. And uh, doing what, what Trump did with the new executive order saying, you know, we're not going to have any H-1B visas. We're not going to have these skilled workers now to be able to come in because you're trying to scapegoat to make it look like the immigrants are the ones who are taking these jobs. Yet again, it's people like himself and his friends who are the ones who are deciding where they're taking those jobs and who is getting those jobs. So again, like we've, we've all been saying, it's a multi-tiered discussion that could go on for a, a long time, so. What's really telling about this is again, like in, in each of, of, of your, your responses, you are still hitting at the main factor that, that this, all these things that have never ever been really resolved and in so many cases have gotten even worse. And I think that in and of itself kind of brings up question number four, um, what we really are looking at uh, within the past month today, of course, marks the one year, the one year, excuse me, the one month anniversary of George Floyd's murder. And we have been seeing consecutive uh, weeks uh, since then of protests and the like, um, and really underscoring, of course, in, in the face of someone's life could be taken by COVID-19 for the lack of 
response from our federal government in some places around the country, state and local governments. But uh, with this question four, we don't know exactly where or how long this is going to go. There's a lot of things that's changing in Washington and in certain police uh, departments and, and school districts and the like. Uh, but where is really going to be sustainable? So for question four, before the uprising, referring to this movement where people of all stripes, all backgrounds to come together and realizing that something needs to change. Uh, again, COVID-19 revealed these well-known disparities and in institutional and systemic racism within our communities throughout the US. Can the uprising be an answer uh, for how we uh, see how our differences uh, tear us apart? Or is it really going to be a movement to really make sure that we could dismantle racism and injustice? I'm going to shoot to Khalil first on, on this one. Yeah, so this is a very, very important <laughs> theoretically based uh, question, <laughs> deep. Uh, but I'm going to actually hope we can take this uh, as a common uh, you know, question to reflect on throughout the entire series, inshallah. Um, and for this one, I would say yes and no in terms of, you know, um, the the uprising um, being in a natural reaction to, um, again, years of systemic racism and injustice was, you know, African-Americans, the uh, horrible death of George Floyd was obviously nothing new, um, <clears throat> especially related to, you know, our, you know, um, you know, the way we go about, you know, presenting, uh, you know, these types of murders, you know, throughout the media. Um, so this was inevitable, um, you know, and the reaction to it, obviously, um, there are some similarities and differences uh, to, you know, this current uprising and the reaction to, you know, um, things that have happened in the past. Um, so I would say yes in that regard. Um, but it seems the more I study, you know, uh, the movement and I study certain elements related to the reaction, uh, unfortunately, you know, I am, you know, um, skeptical uh, in terms of it, you know, having an, an, an independent impact uh, for, you know, overall systemic change, because there are so many element, elements, you know, involved that are not organic towards uh, the feelings and sentiments of African Americans, and particularly, you know, related to this incident, and, um, you know, what has happened. Um, so if, you know, I can be more uh, clear on the issue, you know, um, if you want to take, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, um, you know, uh, there are some uh, questionable elements there, not to offend, you know, because I know brothers and sisters within, you know, uh, that movement. Um, but but like any other movement um, and throughout the history of the U.S. and, you know, movements around the world, um, when you live, especially in a capitalist society, you know, um, first and foremost, you got to be aware because <clears throat> the issue has become, you know, uh, monetized, for example, the media and uh, certain parties with certain agendas. So it's taken you know, that experience away uh, from the movement and put in another place and, and capitalize off of slavery, you know, um, throughout the history of the United States, um, unfortunately has been taken, you know, away from uh, Blacks in this country and, you know, even in, in, in my profession studied uh, for the benefit of, you know, monetary or, you know, material gain, you know, it's just a thing uh, to look at. So, you know, I would say, um, passing on to the rest of the panel that, you know, this particular, you know, instance was George Floyd. And we see the result of, uh, you know, some of the reactions and actions following up to that because there have been many other, you know, murders uh, by, by cops um, of both men and women, um, you know, uh, in the African American community. Um, we see that unfortunately, you know, um, like many other movements in the past, that you know, uh, it's been taken away and, and used for, you know, another uh, agenda, whether it be political, social, economic. Um, I've been thinking deeply today, particularly about the media's responsibility in all of this. 
And, um, you know, unfortunately, you know, um, I think especially as Muslims, again, uh, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we can see through some of these, you know, inconsistencies and, you know, present Islam as a just solution to, you know, a lot of these issues. Sister Saima. Yes, so um, it's a very important question. And um, I, I have a lot of hope, but I have the same answer that yes and no. Uh, no, if we are just taking it as a reaction, like we are getting so impulsive and so reactionary that we, we see one incident and we just react and forget about it. And then we see another incident and then we just, you know, go, all, all of us go in the other direction, like we did with, with Kashmir, with the, there are so many, so many issues we can, you know, count on our fingers right now. So if we are in a reactionary mode, it's, it's not gonna, you know, nothing can be achieved. But yes, it, it is an amazing uprising and uh, if we uh, really think about it, it can lead to so many positivities. It can lead to something really positive, but we really need to uh, think, you know, we really need to reflect and act. So reflection is very, very important and we really, and I think this series is, you know, crucial for this, that we, we, we should every month, we, the community leaders should think, uh, our youth should, think and uh, join this movement. We need leaders like you, mashallah. You know, I'm so proud of all of you. Jazakallah khairan kaseera. <laughs> but alhamdulillah, leaders like you who can continue to inspire, we need inspirational leaders. If we can focus on our youth right now, then, uh, and I, I'm seeing in like, and you can imagine in Glenn Allen, there is a Palestinian sister, girl, high schooler. She was leading the marches here. Uh, it, it was like mind boggling for Black Lives Matter. So SubhanAllah, our youth has so much potential if we can focus on the youth. And I wanna talk to the youth that you have so much, you know, you have so much energy. You have so much, um, you know, talent, mashallah but you have to give it in the right direction, reflect, learn and act. We, we have to, and another thing is that all of us need to read the life of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, how he did it, you know. We have an example, amazing example. He's our role model, how he did it. So really this is the time to think, pause and reflect and act. It's not just only thinking. Like we, we spent so much long years of thinking, thinking, this is the time to act. Every one of us has responsibility. We can do something. We can do something we know, and we know actually what we have to do from our own homes, from our own lives. The racism in our community is very, we all know how uh, you know, it is affecting all of us from our, like we were discussing yesterday, it was so cool. Like someone mentioned that, you know, when we wanna, marry our son or daughter, we don't want to go outside in, a, in another family. So this is, if we are joining the marches, if we are going in the rallies, we have to reflect that, are, am I really removing you know, racism from my own heart and my mind and doing something? This is what Quran teaches us. We have to stand firm for the justice. Uh, no matter if it is against me, against my family, we have to stand firm and join hands and do something. But this is a golden movement, you know, really, inshallah. MashaAllah, thank you for that, Dr. Saima. Um, I'm gonna add to this for you, Brother Aron, a wonderful uh, reminder uh, on uh, how movements sometimes, and I think to Khalil's point, uh, things can, uh, go awry in terms of the organic uh, intentions that's pure uh, when there's the threat of um, monetizing or um, uh, make sure I use this uh, sister's words right, pandering, pimping uh, from corporations or even anyone that's you know powerful or influential in making things happen. So 
Uh, can you reflect on that? Because I think in some ways from your earlier responses as well, we were talking about those who do not have guaranteed rights. When we talk about the workers, when we talk about the undocumented, when we're talking about those who feel the threat of, you know, keeping food on the table and, and other things just to survive, what does that mean when they are confronted by, you know, staying alive by not facing police or staying alive by avoiding an unknown sickness that uh, we're still waiting for a vaccine on? We got to have a whole other month for a uh, discussion just on this topic alone, because, you know, it, Inshallah, if we will. if we're going to get it, you know, th th this is, you know, you've got so many different adages that, that people know, clean up your own backyard is the one that comes to my mind. I've been in the Muslim community for 15 and a half years. I remember one of the earliest things that I uh, was with Brother Alberto, who used to work at Yemen, and we were working at uh, trying to work with day laborers 15 years ago and, and working with day laborers, trying to, to get them a lot of uh, their rights. And a lot of times just getting money, a lot of times from Muslims who they had, had employed them. And he made a great point all those years ago when we were talking about these, a lot of these butcher shops that were, were throughout the city there, Muslim butcher shops. He's like, people are so concerned with getting Zabi Hamid and having it be halal and talking about Zabi Zabi Halal. And, and, but they're employing undocumented workers who they're paying below minimum wage and treating like like garbage. So what in that exactly is halal about how that, that it, just because you invoke the name of Allah when you slaughter the, the animal, that doesn't forgo everything that happened before that. How are the workers even treated? And, and, and then, you know, Brother Khalil you know, mentions the, the fact that we talk about, or, or, or the, uh, the sister did um, about the, the marriage. Yeah, you know, how many people, in the, if, if someone from these communities, if a, if a brown or black brother or sister went to a family and asked for the hand of marriage of a, of a child from one of these families who might be out there in these, these protests, but still turn around and then be like, well, no, 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 not in my family. You know, we have so many different things we really have to explore here because we have to internally look at what's happening within our own community and how we're we addressing those issues. We can't have people in the community turning and talking about how those people are so racist. Look at what they're doing, everyone, when they need to be turning that finger back at themselves or their mom or their dad or their uncle or their cousin or whoever it might else it might be. And, and, and Sister Yesha, you know, mentioned something that, that I've been telling people too for a long time, you know, in this, this, in this time is like, when, when people are getting rid of Aunt Mama like that, they're not doing it because they think it's we're gonna we're gonna we want to and, and and I agree with the pander, but they're not doing it right away because they're pandering. They're doing it because they knew it was racist. They've known it was racist when they're getting rid of the Confederate flag so quickly. NASCAR is like we're getting rid of the Confederate flags. Well, you damn well knew it was a sign of racism. It's so easy for people to then say, yeah, we'll get rid of it. Well, why? Because you already knew. You weren't woke. You didn't get awakened right now just because someone told you. You knew when you just ignored the fact that you knew that that was, that was racist and these were signs of racism. So people within the Muslim community themselves know about this racism. They see it. They, it's, we have to address it and not have this pushback that happens on people who do that work, who try to bring to light these issues. Say, no, 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 you're going to make us look bad. You're going to make us look bad in the bigger community. We're still finding ourselves here. No, Muslim community has been here for 50 plus years. You can't start using that. We're new immigrants. We're not new immigrants. A lot of us aren't even new immigrants. A lot of us got roots here, like myself. No, I got indigenous roots that bring me back to being one of the original people in this, in this land. So not all of us are new here and the community is not new. So you can't get by with that. Well, we're new. We're trying to establish ourselves. People know. So this has to be an awakening not just to what's happening and how some groups are treating other groups. It also has to be, how are we treating a lot of these groups within our communities? Because if we're not addressing that, then, then, it, then it is just pandering. You don't care about what's really happening because you're not really trying to change yourself and your own community first and, for, you know, first and foremost, which is the most important thing to do. I, and then again, I, mean, I could go on for a while and I'm gonna just come yeah. off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So much for time constraints, so it's kind of And and, and and again, each of you, you know, alhamdulillah, we've been able to have discussions before, but I think it's now time as we start to wrap up this panel discussion. And you've already 
each of you been suggesting ways to start being proactive and take uh, action that will hopefully uh, keep us grounded and not just being reactionary, as Dr. Slama said. Um, so going to question five, and again, you know, seeing across purposes of both the COVID-19 and the race, racism uh, as pandemics that are active and live, how can we leverage our, our shared experience for both? And I'm leaving as open uh, ended uh, interpretation because we recognize that each uh, one of us uh, are coming from different walks of life, right? You're able, uh, Brother Aron, just to express like you, you your, your days go back to possibly prior to the founding of the country. And I can also, you know, speak to that, you know, earliest ancestors were someone that was captured enslaved here uh, in the 18th century and as well as others who came here uh, that had scanned that enslaved my people, right? Uh, which also happened to be in my blood. So there's these, these, these known experiences that did not just occur overnight, but it has definitely been ingrained in the DNA of what's now called this experiment of the United States of America. Um, so how, how can we le leverage the shared experiences from both these pandemics, especially when we're seeing like there's this intersectionality of the communities uh, facing injustices and inequity. So particularly in relationship to this, right? The examples are excessive policing in terms of racism and then inadequate healthcare in terms of COVID-19. And this is very also poignant too, because each of our communities, uh, whether, whether we're identified solely as Muslim or within the other parts of our identities, right? So Dr. Slema, uh, Muslim sister, South Asian descent that wears the hijab, um, Brother Arun, who's uh, Latino, and also work with undocumented uh, uh, brothers and sisters um, in many different facets. And then Khalil and I, both African-American, and given our particular past. So um, curious, let's, uh, let's, let's start with Dr. Slema on this one. Because you've definitely been speaking to that spirit of how we harness and, 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 and build towards a positive uh, uh, reactions to uh, challenges. Yes, I, I believe, and I get this is my iman or faith, you can say that we have to build on the positives. You know, if we keep looking at that, although it's very important, if there is a darkness, there is a darkness. But we have to find that smallest ray of light and move towards that. And then maybe we can, you know, go in the bright daylight. So um, my experience with both, um, what I was reflecting and I was thinking, that one thing is that these uh, challenges are massive, huge challenges. These are very difficult. We have very, very difficult uh, situations. I belong to a very pampered uh, family. My, I'm very, like, my husband cooked for me. So it's just, it's, it's a very pampered environment. But as soon as I start working with ICNA Relief, and I learned that, you know, my neighbors, my neighbors uh, don't have food. There are issues in my own backyard. How can I sleep peacefully? I learned that you know there is racism all around us. It's a, this is a sad reality. But the more we join hands, the more we discuss, the more we work together. Uh, and uh, through this uh, pandemic, I learned that that the more we talk to each other, the more we work together, we can we can go somewhere. And then, um, so with ICNA Relief, we are um, planning and we are moving in that direction. We, are, we have right now 80 partner organization, including you know, mosques and churches and massages and synagogues and hospitals and local community organizations and local nonprofits. So Alhamdulillah, we are building amazing partnerships. And I, I think that we are starting that movement of compassion and mercy that we have to we have to change this is how we can sleep peacefully at night <laughs> so um the experience the experience was uh, brutal <laughs> and i can again write a book on that but uh, there is a hope and we can um we have to talk to each other we have to reach out we have to talk to each other and we have to find solutions and uh, we are right now we are doing this you know alhamdulillah with care civic coalition with the, you know, with a uh, respectful guest, Alhamdulillah, we are doing that. 
inshallah, we're gonna hopefully uplift you so you can write that book. For, for healthcare, actually, I wanna add for healthcare that we, are, we have a mobile clinic in Ikhna Relief. We have a network of healthcare, uh, health facilities uh, in the United States. And uh, as we are going in direction of starting a proper telehealth uh, clinic, because in this situation, it's, uh, you know, it's very hard for our communities. Even I, we receive many calls for the patients who are unable to find the, you know, their diabetes, diabetes medications. It's just like very crucial kind of medicines. It was hard for them to find the prescription. And we, we are moving in that direction. Inshallah, soon you'll hear some good news about that. Inshallah, that, that particular last part, um, my, my mother was also impacted by that with some of the uh, places that were looted. Um, my sister had to drive around for more than a half hour miles outside of their residence to make sure my mom could find uh, her medication uh, bill. So inshallah, that will be really noble. So yes, inshallah, we'll hold you to uh, write the book, inshallah. That's not a far-fetched idea. <laughs> A lot of guys you didn't have in Chicago. All right. Uh, let's go with Brother Aron. I think a bit, the, one of the biggest things is that people need to step out of their comfort zones. You know, racism is learned. It's, it's based off of then fear of the other, not knowing other people. If you're a Muslim, you live in the suburbs, come to Masjid al-Farouk for, for a Juma. Get to know some people. Go to Iman for a Juma. I, you know, I, I, I've, I'd never feel more comfortable anywhere else than on the south side if I'm, if I'm at a, a masjid there than, than anywhere else. I feel more welcome than anywhere else I've ever been. And we need to step out of that comfort zone to know other people, to get to know other people, to get to know other Muslims first and foremost. Then we can work on going outside of the community. But first and foremost, is get to know other Muslims. Go to, the, to other communities and, and volunteer and just go don't just show up at Yemen for the community of thar one time one night a year and feel like oh, i went i did my thing i went one time show up on days where there's not a big there's nobody else there you know that's like when i used to do uh legislative work in springfield when i would show up on a tuesday i knew who was really dedicated to the work because on a monday or tuesday when the legislators are first getting there it's empty Go to some of these, these community you know, events and some of these community centers and some of these messages when no one else is there. And one of the things that we need to do too that, that I've seen too much of is that we need to be doing things just because we want to be doing them to help people, not for doing it and then putting on blast. Look what I just did with all this food I, I donated. I've seen it too much in, in, in some of these communities that people who have made money off of having businesses there whether it be a corner store, whether they be an attorney who is getting clients from these neighborhoods. If you're doing good there, you, you, you know, Islamically, we know you're not supposed to be putting your own self on blast. You're not supposed to be hyping yourself up on your Facebook page or anywhere else showing what you just did. You should be doing that. You should already be dedicated to doing that just because that's our, our, what we've been taught. You know, that, that's our example as Muslims. So, there are lots of shining examples of that we can follow and lots of great glimmers that we can see of what people are doing. So we follow those examples. And, and again, we just need to, to get to know one each other better because these experiences that a lot of people in our community that have been going through and been suffering from this pain has not just been happening for the last couple of years. It's been happening for generations. And we need to hear from people to hear their stories so we can understand and hear other people's lived experiences. Yeah, again, I can see hopefully, inshallah, that we can go deeper in these particular issues uh, throughout the series, inshallah. Uh, you probably also, too, need to write a book, Aki, inshallah. So I'll hold you to that as well. Uh, Brother Khalil. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> I basically share uh, the same sentiments as Dr. Simon and Brother Haroun. Uh, related to, you know, uh, what's needed now, um, you know, getting out of our bubble and having a dialogue, we need to learn to, to listen to each other, obviously. Um, and I mean, I would just add that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as Muslims, you know, we understand that he created the conditions for us, you know, uh, 
to come together. You know, a lot of times, you know, um, he creates the conditions for society uh, to move in a certain way. And um, this is one of those issues, you know, whether or not, you know, you believe or see, you know, it as a man-made, uh, you know, thing and something that's a punishment. Um, like Dr. Simon, I like to see, you know, the positive side of things and um, coming together and listening to each other, you know, um, in the communities that we're in, because we are in a very rich environment in terms of Islam and, and, and Muslims and their perspectives. Um, so uh, to, you know, kind of get directly at your question, um, I'll keep it, you know, uh, simple, you know, but, you know, creating that leverage um, to, you know, some of the commonly held beliefs and, um, you know, uh, some of, of the misconceptions, you know, that exists by the white dominant hegemony as opposed to, you know, our minority uh, communities, um, you know, within the context of our society is, is important. Um, you guys are supporting and bringing up the census a lot. Um, and I will say that actually a part of my study is dealing with, you know, urban politics and urban development. And we see that, you know, um, I think with this census, with this census um, it'll be the first time in the United States where there are more people um, living in urban environments and within the cities as opposed to rural areas. So obviously when people come together um, in the way that we do, and we know that a lot of minority communities, you know, um, occupy, you know, um, urban areas. Um, but, you know, especially with a city like Chicago, uh, we see a lot of gentrification, um, a lot of policies being put forth to, margin to continually marginalize um, minority communities, as well as, you know, um, with what your question is stating, excessive policing, healthcare, or lack thereof. Um, but, you know, creating this dialogue is important and, 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 and understanding, you know, um, you know, our capability to leverage, you know, what's happening is, is, is also important. I'll just leave it at that. Inshallah. Just to continue that trope, you too, inshallah, now that you're coming to Accommodition, Looking forward to seeing your works and seeing how they could be applied, inshallah, in the real world beyond academia. So, Allah on that one, man. Uh, final question. And uh, this kind of ties and re circles back to a sort of essence of not only uh, the theme for this webinar, but why we have this series um, in the first place. Uh, just really. Uh, curious on how we're going to make the most of moving forward with everything still feeling uh, abnormal, uh, unprecedented in some cases, but also like drastic uh, seismic changes that's constantly we're having to adapt to, whether it's uh, progressive or regressive in some cases, right? They're alluding to certain states having to uh, close again because they're seeing spikes out there having premature openings or looking at specific policies uh, that has not been really thoroughly addressed um, in the past and, and also seeing what the prospects would be um, if we have a certain turnout, whether the current president is reelected or there's someone else. Uh, does that mean that we continue uh, with the old and what previously normal uh, was will be redefined or stay the same moving forward? So question six, please. So in that sense, how are you individually? And I want to make sure, like, because we are also in our own ways um, adapting as well as in, in, the, in the roles that we play. Uh, how, how are we adapting to uh, both the pandemics and how are you defining and moving towards a new normal, whatever that it means for you? Uh, especially, too, uh, noting that tomorrow, um, Illinois, for those who are viewing us if it happened to be out of state. Illinois is shifting into space for a five, um, which means like just about anything could open with safe distancing and uh, safe social distancing, uh, up to 50 people in certain gatherings. But what does that still mean um, if a lot of these inequities and dis disparities that we've noted persist and still no clear and insight for these things? Um, Let's start off again with Brother uh, Khalil and then work uh, towards Brother Aron and then Sister Dr. Saima to close us out. Um, yeah, so obviously, you know, this is still a, a very dynamic and fluid uh, situation uh, moving towards the new normal. 
Um, me personally, um, uh, again, I continue um, to educate myself with, uh, you know, rich and, um, and, and viable resources and, 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 and media outlets related to, um, <clears throat> you know, this pandemic um, and the uprising for that matter. But um, I think uh, another issue that I would like to highlight, you know, related to this question is the need, um, you know, to to gravitate towards, you know, what 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 our science and data, you know, is saying. And I'm just I'm not just saying that as an academic, but um, you know, I've had discussions with, uh, for example, European officials related to how they handle, you know, um, you know, the, the the pandemic in different states of of, of Europe, and um, you know, what some of the trends are globally. <clears throat> I think one of the worst things that we could do because this is a this is a global pandemic, um, and I, I, I'm kind of sensing, you know, especially with the Trump administration, a little arrogance related to, you know, how uh, the U.S. Is, is is standing with it as opposed to other parts of the world, uh, which is very, you know, in my opinion, very very uh, dangerous. Um, you know, this is a global pandemic affecting the whole world, um, and you know, as 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 a Muslim, you know, looking at it through my Islamic filter. You know, um, one of those things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us with and the more, <laughs> you know, arrogant, you know, uh, we become, you know, uh, the, you know, um, the more, you know, damaging uh, some of the consequences can be, um, you know, just evaluating, you know, Islam and the Quran and our history. But, uh, yeah, moving towards the new normal is... You know, one of those things that I'm still trying to figure out, to be honest with you, uh, I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, I have the answer to that. Um, and, uh, you know, like you say, Illinois is, is shifting tomorrow from, um, you know, phase three to four. Uh, but me personally, I might, you know, fall back a little bit. I'm not going to get too excited <laughs> because, you know, um, you know, I play chess and in chess, I know the pawns go first, you know, not to belittle anybody else who are in situations where, they have to, you know, um, you know, compromise some things. I mean, we all as a minority community and gonna be in certain situations. I'm just personally gonna try to limit it for safety of myself and and and, and family members. You know, I did have, you know, um, I, I do know people who've been, you know, heavily affected, you know, um, by this virus and, and still, you know, heavily affected by uh, the pandemic. And so, you know, um, me personally, I just, you know, I want to try to continue to educate myself and be involved in platforms such as this. So, uh, inshallah, I'll leave it at that. And before I have Dr. Samia, Samia comes on, I, I didn't realize we're at 729, so apologies for uh, extension. We hope that you can stay on, but if not, we totally understand. Uh, we still want to address uh, a couple of things uh, as we end with this final question. Uh, but Dr. Samia. It's a very good question, uh, Brother Jihad. Mashallah. So, um, on organization wise, uh, at a personal level, I'm, um, I kind of, I don't know if I should say that or not, but I kind of like, uh, like it. Like, you know, you are spending more time with your family. So, uh, it is uh, a new norm. If, you know, we can live in the minimum. It's a new learning phase that we can do so much uh, without going out, without spending time, without you know spending time on uh, in shopping malls or you know uh, weird uh, uh, looking at the sales and other things. So you, it's it's kind of a good learning curve for me that you know your family is important. You can cook food at home. You can spend time with family, and this is good. This is a blessing. Uh, that's one thing, but in terms of, of my organization, we are, um, we learned that now uh, our community members are going through very, very tough time. It's a very tough time. Many, many, many family members have uh, lost their jobs and they are suffering. Uh, courts, uh, now they can be evicted, you know, easily because there was some pause for two to three months. Now they, they, if they are not paying rent, there will, there will be a lot of evictions and uh, they need rent and we are receiving hundreds and hundreds of requests for, these, uh, for this rent. And we don't know from where we are gonna get. So um, what we, we are planning that we, are, we will be reaching out to our community members one by one. We'll be making uh, well-being calls as we were doing. We are going to expand that work. Uh, we are not going to give up in this situation. 
Uh, giving up is not an option. So, and uh, second thing is we never depended on the government grants or funds. So we always, uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, a community, Muslim community and uh, uh, people of other faith has been supporting Iknadali. Giving up is not an option. We are not depending on the funds. And we are basically, we, are, we need volunteers. So uh, right now we have almost 300 beautiful, amazing volunteers who are helping us out on daily basis with different things. You say, you know, loading or unloading the truck or making phone calls or doing the case assessment, case management, uh, connecting these families with the right resources. We do the training, we do mentor training and there are many, many other things we do. So um, our focus is one is recruiting more volunteers. Second is we are focusing for back to school. In August, there will be a back to school. And then uh, we are planning a very nice campaign for that. Not only supplies for students and kids, uh, we are also doing something for the teachers, inshallah. And you will uh, hear more details soon. We are also planning some support group for the parents because they are also, they don't have any help at home. They have to do, you know, they have to teach at home. They have to work from home. And uh, they have to do everything and they, didn't, they have never been in that experience. I'm the national director for back to school nationally. And we did 50,000 backpacks and supplies last year and uh, in 415 cities nationally. So uh, this year it, it will be another uh, amazing back to school campaign. So we are planning that inshallah. And again, same thing is that, uh, you know, um, this is the movement of compassion and mercy. Anyone can call me crazy, but we have to do it for our job so we can sleep peacefully. And we really would like to work with each other, work together and start from your own home, see who is worried and talk to them, and then reach out to your neighbors and see how your neighbors are doing. And then, you know, the circle will grow, inshallah. So we have, we have many plans in the pipeline and uh, yeah, this new normal will be uh, fantastic. <laughs> Let's see. Inshallah, and, and alhamdulillah, very much happy to hear that you guys have made strides to help community more so, uh, still receiving and looking for others to help and share in the bottom line, inshallah. Thanks, Dr. Saima. But I don't um, I'll keep it brief because I see we're, we're past. So the, uh, really, I, I think it's similar to what people in the Muslim community can do, what, you know, when I look at my field, look at civil rights law as well, it, it, it's very similar in the sense that when we engage communities, we, we have to engage them um, all the time, year round, not in times of crises. We don't go into community when there's a crisis and say, hey, we want to help you. Because far too often I've seen many different nonprofits that I've, that I've uh, been affiliated with and not not saying it's now but I'm just saying in general it's, it's, it's a common issue I've seen amongst many different groups is that you go into the community when the time when the crisis arises or when it when it rises and the way I've explained it this to people is like if you had a, a growth on your leg and it's it's this size and you just think oh you know I'll get it looked at I'll get it looked at a year later you look and that thing's gotten to this size you're too late you've got to be engaged in community so that it also shows that it's a sincere desire to work in these communities and engage people in these communities. So just in general, we need to do a better job at reaching out and it, whether it be through civil rights law, whether it be in the Muslim community, engaging others and talking to others and hearing from others and hearing their opinions and just hearing about what's, what's facing them. What are the issues that they see? Cause we don't, we don't ask a lot of times just when you go into a community and you think you're doing good, you should be asking the people in the community first and foremost, what do you need? Not going to the community thinking you know what they need, asking them, what do you need? How can we help? Shukran. And that concludes the panel. Um, we just have for the game since we went over, thanks to each and every one of you that stayed with us. Uh, so we have just two quick uh, questions that have been submitted. Um, so we'll kind of, uh, this was addressed to brother Khalil, but, um, if anyone else uh, wants to chime in briefly, uh, that is, uh, brother Khalil, you mentioned a few times that Islam could be a solution to systemic racism in the United States. Um, how do you envision this, especially considering 
the Muslim communities uh, so divided and I'm sure that probably again, the others want to chime in, but a clip. Yeah, uh, that's a beautiful question. Um, so I will clarify that I, I think that Islam is a, uh, not the solution to systemic racism, but a solution for the system and for racism. Um, because Islam has, you know, a system, obviously, as we believe as Muslims, our aqidah is all comprehensive. It covers every aspect of life. So, you know, simply put, we can offer this as, as a solution, you know, both on the individual and collective level uh, to uh, those around us. Um, so uh, in terms of racism itself, we know that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in his last sermon, Khutbah uh, al-Hijjah, you know, he emphasized um, the... Um, the uh, unity of all people, you know, uh, we know the hadith that there's no favor in skin color, just in our deeds. So as Muslims, we, you know, we understand this as being an, an integral part of our aqidah. Um, the uh, second part of the question related to, you know, how can we come together as Muslims in a community? You know, I would especially look at it from you know, um, my environment, uh, particularly that being from, you know, a big city um, and looking at other big cities that, you know, I've traveled to and visited frequently, Detroit, New York, et cetera. Um, I think that, you know, and I'm talking from the perspective of, you know, obviously an African-American convert to Islam, um, but I think one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the blessings uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, you know, and I'm pretty sure you can attest to this, um, was that, you know, moving to the north side of Chicago after growing up on the south side and west side uh, for the early part of my years, um, but moving to a very diverse and rich community of Muslims, um, getting different perspectives of, you know, Islam and um, the different Muslims from all over the world, which have highly influenced me and my perspective in terms of understanding a lot of the barriers that exist in the community. Now, I'll close with saying that in a city like Chicago, which is very segregated by nature and by structure, historically and systemically, um, it's kind of hard to overcome some of those barriers based off, of, uh, based off of the point of view of an immigrant, you know, in my opinion. And I'll let, to, I'll let the other panel, panelists speak to this, but, um, you know, I, I think, you know, going back to Islam, simply put, um, this is very important and very key to understanding, you know, what I just mentioned that, you know, this is Islam and, you know, all these issues that exist regarding racism, you, you know, it's null and void, even though we acknowledge they exist, but understanding that, you know, the system has, you know, perpetrated uh, a lot of the influences, immigrants coming from different communities, different parts of the world, trying to get a piece of this capitalist pie um, is the problem. You know, um, and so I think we should address it as such, you know, and address as they, you know, say the elephant in the room. Ooh. Okay, uh, that 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 in and of itself is a continuance. So we'll, we'll also be talking about that, brother. Um, again, just for the sake of time, uh, if someone else wanted to respond. Uh, let's try to get the second uh, question in. And this will be the final question. And again, thanks to everyone that stayed on. Um, what should I, as an individual, do after learning about all these issues? Um, how can I make a change in my own community? So I think uh, each of you have addressed that in some way, shape, or fashion. So I'm also going to try to make sure uh, you keep it brief. But uh, if you haven't and want to also respond to the previous question within that response, by all means, please do. Um, can I say? Uh, so, All means, Dr. Simon, please. Yes, yeah, so there are a few things which I, I always mention about volunteering, you know, join hands. We, I want to mention another resource is ICNA Social Justice. Uh, you can also learn something from that Civic Coalition Care Chicago. So volunteering would be the, for me, volunteering would be the first step. And just observe first and, and inshallah, then you will you will do really good. All right. Um, I think, yeah, brother Ron, he, he seems uh, he's content. So we'll just close it there. Um, before we close, I just want to jump ahead. We do have a resource guide, uh, but since we're going to post 
this live recording. You can access the uh, resource guide uh, to the organizations that uh, coordinated and sponsored this event, uh, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, as well as CARE Chicago, uh, that have additional resources, but also ICNO Relief, uh, Dr. Saima, who works with them, as you already heard, has done a lot of phenomenal work, uh, especially in uh, expanded partnerships with local uh, institutions and organizations. Be sure to check them out. Um, however, we also want to zoom in on a lot of the organizations that are also committed to uh, fighting anti-Blackness and racism. Uh, so I'm gonna jump at first, um, before I mentioned Inner City Muslim Action Network, Iman, an uh, organization I've also worked with, but Ron was on uh, staff for quite a substantial period of time and a previous volunteer as well. Uh, Black Muslim uh, COVID-19 Coalition. So this is a group of various uh, Black Masajid, uh, Black serving community, serving massage and organizations. Uh, they're looking constantly for uh, volunteers as well as partner organizations, either in allyship or directly in advocacy. So please check them out. Uh, Worry-Free Community and Believers Bailout has also been doing a lot of phenomenal work. Uh, so again, uh, check out those links and be sure to follow up. But I want to be sure that we do not close without this wonderful, important uh, event that's coming up. I'm gonna introduce Sister Yasha Abraham, who is a partnership fellow with the Illinois Civic Muslim Coalition. And uh, she'll tell you about this important Blackout Tuesday event uh, that will be happening uh, in two weeks, I guess, the summer will be. Uh, Sister Yasha, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, Salam alaikum, everybody. Um, thank you for that introduction, Brother Gerald. Um, my name is Yesha Abraham, and I am a partnership fellow, newly integrated into the coalition. So it's my honor and pleasure to be here with you today. Um, the crux of what I'm going to talk about today is a movement called Blackout Tuesday. So it was made popular roughly a few weeks ago in a way that really wasn't very much in the spirit of what the day was actually about. It is not um, a performative blacking out of social media screens. It is an actual day of divestment of dollars. So what that means is on July 7th, which was strategically chosen because it's not going to be on a holiday where a lot of businesses are closed. It's in the middle of a week where people are really thirsty for business. And so um, I think a few years ago, we had a day with no Mexicans, right? Well, before that, we had still been doing blackout days where black dollars were only spent on black businesses. It's reported that the black American dollar constitutes about $1.3 trillion of all consumerism practiced here in this country. So just imagine what it would be like for that, for that money not to be filtered into the commercial economy. So that is what we, we propose everybody do, not just Black people, but everybody. Black out with us. And if you're going to spend money, spend money with Black businesses. We are very lucky to be in a city that is brimming to overflowing with Black entrepreneurship. There are tons of places that you can go to spend money on food owned by Black people, clothing made by Black people, and just about everything else that you could imagine consuming by Black people. So again, that is July 7th, the Tuesday right after 4th of July, blackout, divest your dollars from people who profit from oppression. Shakran, Sister Yesha, thank you. And my apologies for mispronouncing the name, recognize and represent and respect. Um, is there a source uh, that you can direct to the participants to learn more about uh, this uh, important initiative? Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, uh, anything that you want to know is going to be a Google click away. I mean, before I got on, I even saw that even BuzzFeed has an article about the origins of the blackout movement. So this year, it's a Tuesday, right? But it can be another day of the week. Any day of the week, people can catch our blackout hands. <laughs> Real talk. Thank you so much. And for our own, just to let it be known, it was called a day. 
without immigrants back in 2017. And so in, this, in, this, in that spirit that Yesha just said, uh, we can all come together. It does not have to be solely black folk um, involved with that because we all know what, especially in the light of the COVID money is seemed like it's everything in spite of lives being killed, lives being maimed, lives being dismissed. So by mm -hmm. all means, appreciate you, Sister Yesha. And what's more, um, if you have more information, uh, please look back to uh, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition's page, both for Facebook and YouTube. You will get to, again, hear Sister Yesha, as well as the rest of the panel discussion, as well as you can go to Care Chicago's uh, YouTube and Facebook pages as well. Uh, we'll be coming soon to announce the second uh, webinar. By all means, if you enjoyed it and found it very informative, by all means, let your peoples know to come check us out. Um, and again, uh, in the spirit of all that is worth uh, being in solidarity, whether in the traditions of the Deen of al Islam or just in whatever togetherness that Allah and God or the higher power brings forth, uh, please go with God and be safe and be loved and be in good works, uh, sustainable works, inshallah. With that, thank you so much. Do have a good night. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you for participating.